Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the ABYC Exporting Boats to Europe and Overflow webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please use your chat feature located on the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach the operator, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded on Thursday, April 7, 2011. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mike New. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. This webinar is a part of an ongoing series of ABYC educational webinars. You are connected to Selling Boats to Europe, the European Union, and Overview. Hello, my name is Mike New. I'm the Director of Educational Services at ABYC, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Please take a moment now to adjust the volume on your computer to a comfortable level. Using a PC with attached computer audio speakers is really the best way for this format. It gives you a lot of control to get a comfortable volume. You may call in to hear the audio if you're having a problem, but we really recommend the most comfortable way to enjoy the webinars with a VOIP, a voice over Internet. If you're having any problems getting into the webinar, you can always call Sandy at our office. And the ABYC number is 410-990-4460. You um, may want to take a moment now to have, just, just to be sure you have on your desk a pen and a sheet of paper taking a free a few brief notes will help you retain information that you can use. The webinar is mainly a listen-only learning experience. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of ability to take questions during the webinar. However, we will use the chat feature. If you have a question, I will monitor that and keep an eye on that. And if it seems appropriate at the time, I'll interrupt. And if not, we'll hold off till the end of the presentation and try to get the questions in then. Now before we move into the technical aspect of the presentation, I'd like to make you all aware that ABYC certification classes are delivered in locations throughout the country and even around the world on a regular basis. We have eight different levels of certification. Now this summer we'll be going to nine with our newest accident investigation. These classes generally run from three to four days and include an industry certification that's available via exam on the last day. Upon successful completion, you'll be listed on the ABYC website in our Certified Technician Directory. The classes are listed on the Education Department calendar on our website. We also partner with several marine trades associations around the country, and we work with them to provide classes at a reduced cost. We work with Maine, and Washington, New York, Virginia, Maryland, Florida, um, I can't think of another, um, California at one time. If you think this is something you could benefit from, we encourage you to contact your own marine trades group and have them call us here at ABYC. We would love to bring a group class to your area. Now for our presenters today, we actually have two gentlemen with us. Uh, someone who's been with us before is Mr. John Aidey. He's head of the technical department here at ABYC and a vice president of ABYC. He is our technical director. He runs our standards writing PTC committees and is very involved in the industry. With him is an ABYC lead instructor, one of our lead instructors, Dennis Bono. Dennis does a lot of standards training for us and is very knowledgeable in the similarities and differences between standards and ABYC in Europe. They both have experiencing, experience in moving boats back and forth across the Atlantic. And today we'd like to talk to you about some of the nuances of selling boats to the European Union. With that, John, without further introduction, John, would you take, take the uh, ball from here? Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Thank uh, welcome to everyone on the uh, webinar. It's uh, good to see some familiar faces there or familiar names. And uh, looking forward to, uh, to chatting with you a bit about uh, getting boats over to Europe. Uh, I was really excited about doing this uh, with Dennis. Uh, Dennis and I have uh, spoken together and worked together for a long time, and I think it works well. I, I do more of the standards and the, the business side of sending things to the European Union, where Dennis is actually out there doing the inspections and dealing with the paperwork and all of the, uh, the things on the ground. So it's a, it's a good mix. And uh, with that introduction, we'll just go ahead and get going on this. 
really what we would like to show you um, in this presentation today is, is really why are we bothering with the European Union and, and why are we going over there and why does ABYC spend so much effort um, getting boats uh, to the European Union and dealing with the standards? And, and what is the CE mark and what goes into it and what are the nuances of that particular uh, that, that brand or that mark that you see everywhere, um, not just in the European Union, but all over the world you'll see CE mark products. So if you have a non-CE boat, how do you get it into the EU? And what is a PCA or a post-construction assessment? And then we hope we'll have some time for some wrap-up and some questions there as well. So uh, with that slight introduction, uh, let's, let's get into uh, to the meat of things. Um, I'm going to start off, and then I'll lead it over to Dennis. But first of all, you may want to take an aspirin. We've got a lot of acronyms coming your way. Uh, you'll see some of them on the screen right now. Uh, we're dealing with ISO, CE, RSG, RCD, IMCI, all of these other things, and uh, this is just something that uh, you'll have to get used to, but we will try to explain every acronym that's out there, and if there's something missing, please uh, feel free to uh, float a chat over, and we'll go ahead and clarify that. I think Dennis will tell you the same thing. We're so used to dealing with it that we just uh, rattle these acronyms off, and, and we forget that there's people out there that may not have uh, had the same exposure to it that we have. The, the first thing that I get asked a lot about the European Union is why is there all this, this uh, you know, craziness about sending things to Europe and, and what's, so, uh, you know, what's so special about Europe. Well, one of the first things I'd like to tell you is that Europeans build ugly boats. Um, and that's, uh, that's, this is where you can laugh, although I can't hear you. Um, <laughs> with these European boats, you, you know, their, their style is different. Their type of boating is different. They're used to a more offshore, enclosed cabin type of boat. Uh, they don't even know what a bow rider is. Uh, when they see one of these things, they go, wow, let's check this out. I mean, this is a totally different type of boat and type of boating that we're used to. So I think the U.S. product uh, makes boating a little more accessible to Europeans. It's a little less expensive. It's a little less labor-intensive. It's a little less yacht club-like. I mean, Dennis, how do you feel about that? I, I think that pretty much says it. That does sum it up. Yeah, exactly right. So... Um, you know, that, that's really what we're, what we're going after here. The other thing you have to keep in mind is you see all the flags on your screen. The European Union is rapidly um, continuing to be the largest consumer market on the face of the planet. Now, China will be the largest consumer market on the face of the planet should they get their, uh, their act together and start modernizing some things and getting into facilities. But right now you've got 27 countries with three additional country candidates on the list that do make up a giant consumer market. So ignoring that as part of your, uh, uh, you know, your business model is probably not a good idea. So when you start to think about those things, that's what makes it incredibly lucrative to consider sending U.S. boats to the European Union. Now that's boats that are, uh, are built here, brand new boats built to the, the uh, CE specs and sent over to Europe. It's also people who are selling their boats here finding foreign buyers because you've got a, a lucrative currency exchange. Uh, you're looking at, I believe, last time I looked, it was $1.69 um, per one euro. So when you think about buying in euros, you get a great bargain by buying a U.S. boat. Um, so that makes it a little more, uh, a little more opportune, and you'll find it's cyclical with the, uh, with the currency. And uh, you know, thus far, uh, it does fluctuate, but we have not seen the, the euro and the dollar equal each other uh, at this point. So I think you're going to see a little bit of this uh, going along for the foreseeable future. One of the in, in addition to that, you'll also see countries uh, that are not part of the EU that are now insisting on CE certification, countries like uh, Switzerland, uh, Egypt now is uh, on occasion requiring CE. So not only the EU countries are, are participating in the CE marking of boats. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point, Dennis, because it's, um, it's relatively easy to grab the, uh, the CE package or the, uh, the CE experience from Europe and apply it to your, uh, to your country if you're looking for a little more legalistic approach than ABYC offers. Uh, so that's, that's an excellent point, and I think you're right. We're going to see more of that in different countries, um, like Canada, for instance, CE or ABYC. Australia, uh, kind of the same methodology there as well, where it's, a, it's an either-or. So uh, that's an excellent point. Um, hold on, I skipped one here. There we go. Okay, um, what is the CE mark? Um, I've heard it called uh, all different things, but what it is, it's conformity European, it's French. Uh, for some reason, they like to do everything backwards. Uh, for instance, ISO stands for International, or, uh, International Organization for Standardization. I would call it the International Standardization Organization, but again, they have to be slightly different. So here we have the CE mark 
stands for uh, European Conformity, and you will see the, that CE mark on anything from stuffed animals to calculators to uh, underwear to boats. So it is the mark that allows goods to be uh, passed throughout all of those 27 EU countries. Um, you know, think about our 50 states, and if you built a um, you, know, you built a baseball bat in New Jersey and you wanted to sell it in New York, New York's laws were different for baseball bats. They don't allow aluminum or they don't allow wood or they don't allow, uh, you know, hardwoods to be used. You could not sell a New Jersey baseball bat in New York. Uh, that could create all kinds of problems. Well, this is the climate you had in the European Union where you couldn't sell from France to uh, Great Britain without the French product meeting the laws of Great Britain. So when everyone signed up for the European community, uh, they decided to go with... Uh, uh, you know, laws for all the common products. So therefore, if I built something in Belgium, I could easily send it to France without a problem. And this goes along with boats. Dennis, you have any comment on that? Uh, yeah, before uh, before the European Union, we used to have, uh, if you were going to France, you would deal with Veritas. If you were um, in the northern portion, you would be maybe uh, using Det Norsk. Or, uh, uh, so uh, in essence, they've basically combined all of the uh, standards and uh, harmonized. That's the key word you'll hear a lot is harmonized. Standards are being harmonized. Matter of fact, ABYC works closely with the ISO group, and uh, you'll see some of the ABYC standards uh, getting harmonized with the ISO standards. Yeah, and that's an important point. When all of this started in the, uh, in, I would say, the mid-'80s, um, you know, ABYC was smart enough to go ahead and offer our standards as a basis for the ISO standards. So even though things aren't exactly the same, there are some very familiar uh, requirements uh, in, uh, in the ISO standards for uh, boats, which is, uh, brings me to my next slide which talks about who the players are and where the different levels are. Um, if you see the slide up on your screen now, I have a couple different levels here, uh, starting out with your TC-188 standards, and that's Technical Committee 188. That is where ABYC gets heavily involved. We are the technical advisory group to that, uh, that particular TC. Now, 188, uh, they are numerical on the ISO side, so there is a TC-1, and there are several technical committees. It doesn't matter whether you're dealing with electrical, uh, whether you're dealing with stuffed animals, whether you're dealing with electronic parts, cell phones, everyone has a different TC. Uh, we happen to be 188. Then we have a document called the Recreational Craft Directive, which uh, Dennis will talk about in a little bit more detail, and I have a slide on that coming up next. But um, that is the document that contains all the rules, the standards, and the procedures for how the boat is supposed to be built. So you'll hear Dennis refer to the directive, the directive. That's what that is. Then you have another group called the Recreational Craft Sectoral Group, which is the RSG. Now, the directive was so confusing that another group got together and they decided that they would uh, create documentation to support the directive to be able to make sure that all of us interpret it the same way. So if you're going to test a windshield, for instance, for uh, light transmission, uh, the guy in Belgium is going to do it the same way as the guy in Finland. Um, so that's what that's for, which leads us to notified bodies. Those are the guys that are actually doing the testing and providing the paperwork, and that's going to be Dennis's perspective. Uh, and then the bottom of the pile is the manufacturers having to deal with all of this stuff on top of them in order to sell a boat into the European Union. So uh, on my next slide, we'll talk about the directive. And Dennis, why don't you run with this one? You're yeah, the original directive... With. Yeah, the original directive was the 95, uh, 9425 EC, and it's been amended um, a couple of times now. Uh, the current uh, amendment is the 0344 EC. Now, that doesn't mean that the standards aren't getting updated regularly, and, um, and that's happening um, on a similar basis as the ABYC uh, standards get updated, three to five years. You'll also see some of the... Uh, um, the ISO standards get up updated at a similar pace. Um, on occasion, you'll see uh, updates uh, just uh, whether they go to three, five years, you'll see them come up uh, maybe a year later, depending on uh, what the situation is. So they've had a few accidents over in Europe, so now we've seen changes to the stability documentation. So these documents like ABYC are constantly evolving, and there's always uh, seems to be new requirements. And I'll briefly touch, they're, they're now talking about what they call a new approach. Uh, what the timeline for this is is unknown at this point, but basically they're going to ask uh, in the future that manufacturers comply with new standards as they come about. Um, as it is right now, once you get a certificate, if you don't change anything on your vessel, 
uh, you're allowed to build under your old certificate and disregard any new regulations that come through. So that's coming down the road, not sure when, but it's certainly being talked about and they're calling it the new approach. Yeah, thanks for that, Dennis. Uh, fortunately, when it comes to ISO work, uh, we have uh, been ingrained in that process for quite some time. So uh, the, the leaders of the different standards groups or the different working groups um, are from all over the world, but we're fortunate enough to have about nine working groups uh, that are headed by U.S. folks. Uh, I'm in charge of uh, two of them. Uh, another gentleman named Tom Marhevko from NMMA is in charge of uh, one or two. Uh, Dave Marlowe from Brunswick Boat Group has, uh, has a, a working group under his purview. So we are about as aligned as we can be, being uh, non-European citizens uh, in the ISO process. But basically, when you think of ISO, it's, uh, it is supposed to be the global standard, okay? And ISO stands for the International Organization of Standardization. Uh, again, just like our CE mark, um, it, it's a little backwards, but that's what ISO stands for. Julia, I grabbed that question, so thanks for that. Um, but they are the standards writer for every product you can think of in the European Union. And like Dennis said before, it's very easy for countries to go ahead and pick up this ISO format and, um, and run with it and take it as part of their law instead of having small organizations like ABYC within their own country write standards. So that's what ISO is. So when you think about um, you know, getting involved in this, you need a group like ABYC to coordinate the efforts and make sure you have the right people there, the right expertise. The last thing you want is to send six Americans over to a foreign meeting and uh, you know, embarrass themselves or or not, um, you know, not have the facts and not have the issues. So we do have a highly coordinated um, effort uh, on this. So we make sure that we have pre-meetings over here on U.S. soil. We make sure we get the right people where they need to be. So the key here is, is that uh, the involvement with ABYC really is the, the bucket, if you will, for, um, for all of the uh, ISO activities from the United States. So let's jump into the main differences between ABYC and ISO, and this will be my last slide, and then I'll be turning it over to Dennis to get into uh, the PCA, or the post-construction assessment. And um, really the big differences here when it comes to ISO is they use a category system. You got category A, you got category B, C, and D. And what these different letters mean is that you are really intending to uh, tell the person what conditions the boat is supposed to be used in. So for instance, category A is the most stringent category, and it, it brings into account uh, wind and wave heights um, and uh, a number of self-sufficiency requirements. And then you go down to category D over here on the right, and category D ends up being the uh, lakes and rivers and things like that. And Dennis is going to show you a, a capacity plate later on. But really, A being the most extreme, uh, this is the one that you'll find are you know, offshore type boats most of the boats that go over from the United States are category B and C. So you'll see most of those, and I think Dennis will elaborate on that. Uh, but really, ISO takes into account how you're going to use the boat, not just what the boat is. And I find that very interesting. And sometimes it's encouraging. It may be a good thing here, but other times it just gets so complicated. I mean, Dennis, how long is the document that describes those categories? It's several pages. It, it can be, yeah. It's, um, you know, the... the Actual description of the the conditions is a very short, um, uh, very short paragraph um, or several paragraphs. But the supporting documents, the ISO standards, that allows you to, to dictate which category you're going to be in is quite extensive. And we'll get into that. Right. Right. Okay. And uh, so that really does it for the political climate and why we're even talking about this. So Dennis, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to flip your slide, and you can take it from there. Uh, and then I get to go ahead and interrupt you while you're talking. Sure. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Well, we're going to concentrate a little bit on post-construction assessment. Um, the certification is uh, somewhat similar to a new manufacturer, and I see we have several new manufacturers uh, that are listening in today. Uh, but uh, I'm sure you get the calls on, hey, I've got a 06 boat or an 08 boat or whatever the case may be, and uh, we have a buyer, either it's a call from your broker or one of your dealers, you know, what do I need to do? Well, in that case, if there's not much supporting document or if you're uh, as a manufacturer, uh, don't want to be involved in the, all of the regulations that will be applicable to your boat, 
uh, you can recommend what they call post-construction assessment. And that entails that, uh, a number of things, but basically it gets you as the new builder out from the requirements and now puts the onus onto the new owner or the boat dealer or the company that's buying the boat. So we're going to concentrate here on post-construction, which is boats going there where the, where the uh, boat builder does not want to support a CE marking of the craft. Let me move. Next slide. Oh, okay, went too far. The first thing, before we get into it, um, everybody's asked, one of the common questions is, what's a notified body? Why do I have to use one? Well, notified body is those entrusted to uh, issue certificates to vessels, to craft, recreational craft. There is at least 20 of them out there, maybe 19 these days. Uh, you've heard some of them, the IMCI, there's Gamasha Lloyd, there's Lloyds of London, there's uh, HPI, uh, there's several. Um, uh, but we need some, you need a notified body to issue that certificate. Okay. In addition to the issuing the certificate, some of the notified bodies will also provide you a builder's plate and supplemental hull numbers, and we'll get into that in just a moment. The uh, first uh, thing that I always recommend to anybody before they get into the standards is to look at the RSG guidelines. That's the Recreational Sectoral Group who interpret the rules. Okay, and they, uh, they publish a synopsis of what your requirements are. So before you even get into the standards, I always recommend what are the, uh, to look at the guidelines and what is actually applicable to be and um, in my craft. Uh, they have a website that I have here listed as uh, the rsg.be. They are located in Belgium. Okay, they do assist in the uniform application of the recreational craft directives. All the notified bodies have to uh, follow these or anybody else with a valid interest. Okay, and if you want to find the RSG guidelines, IMCI has a website here that uh, does have the actual verbiage of those RSG guidelines that you can read. As I mentioned before, why do you want to post construction? Well, the original manufacturer does not want to take responsibility for putting what the EU calls the craft on the market. Okay, that means allowing it to be used, to be sold, uh, to be insured, or to be financed. There are many, many reasons to get the uh, PCA or the CE mark. Uh, we are talking new and used boats, not, uh, not just older boats, but we can use new craft. So if we have a uh, an O11 model and the uh, manufacturer doesn't want to get involved, you are allowed to CE mark a brand new craft. Okay. If you're converting a commercial or a racing boat into a recreational craft, you will have to do a PCA. Okay. And the key here is whoever is purchasing the boat is now becomes, uh, assumes a responsibility and in effect becomes the <clears throat> excuse me, manufacturer. There are a couple of exemptions. If you are a European citizen and you've built your own boat, if you own it uh, for five years, you don't have to worry about CE marking the craft. Or actually, there's a minimum requirement that you have to own it, be in your possession for five years. And then both solely for racing or experimental are also exempt from the requirements. So what are the requirements? Well, first thing is, each boat requires a physical inspection. We're not allowed to do videotaping or uh, send me photographs, here's my boat. We actually, you have to have a certified inspector uh, come in and view the boat and make sure it complies with the current directives. From that inspection, we issue a variation report. And uh, here's where a lot of the marinas and, uh, and workers have been making money is repairing those variances. That could include anything, maybe some electrical work, some some uh, fire prevention work, uh, the, the list can uh, cover many, many things. Um, so there are some opportunities on making, making those repairs. We also may require some other tests. We might need a stability test. We may need a sound test. We'll get those uh, in a moment. And then it also requires certain documents be prepared. We need a declaration of conformity. That's one of the main documents that says this vessel complies with all of the regulations in place as of this date. 
Okay, we have a report of conformity. That's an, uh, another document that's issued that's generally filled out by an inspector, submitted to the notified body, and uh, placed uh, and uh, forwarded on to the new owner. We have an application that must be filled out, and the variation report also must be sent to, uh, uh, to the notified body. And Dennis, this is a good time to mention some of the uh, notified bodies that are uh, less than uh, forthcoming with you know, what their credentials are and things. There are a lot of uh, quick and dirty uh, CE my boat type people out there that will do exactly what Dennis said you can't do. They'll say, email me a packet of photos or a video, and then we'll go ahead and send your, uh, send your documentation back. And uh, it's definitely something you want to check these guys out. It's like having a contractor build your house. Just check them out. Make sure they have other boats in the European Union, and make sure they're on the up and up. Correct, correct. A lot of, there's a lot of fake certificates out there, and, um, you know, certainly there's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's not inexpensive at times. Certainly it's um, uh, the smaller the boat, the economics may not work out. So there is, um, uh, there is certainly fraud out there. Uh, for producing fake certificates. So certainly be aware and uh, be diligent in um, who you choose. So there's the documents. <clears throat> One of the items that uh, the uh, uh, notified body will provide you with or should provide you with is a builder's plate. There's the standard builder's plate here where it shows the owner, owner's name, the category of the vessel. We'll talk about that in a moment. Here we have a category of C and D, okay, so you can actually make a dual category boat. Some of the boats, if the capacity uh, is insufficient to make category C, they will reduce from 12 to 6 in this case. So they'll have, you know, they'll allow 12 people on this vessel uh, in category D conditions, and they'll allow uh, 6 in category C. And you'll also see here that they've also reduced the capacity, the actual baggage in person's weight from 1220 from a category D to a 600 kilogram for C, okay? You'll also see here, when we're talking post-construction, you will see post-construction must be placed on to the builder's plate as well. And here is the notified body that processed the application. And as John mentioned earlier, here's the CE mark. Now also you'll have to have supplemental HIN numbers. And in this case, we have two numbers, okay? The European Union calls it a craft ID number. So here we call it a hall identification. They call it a craft ID, okay? So the notified body will issue these, and you'll see they actually have a four-digit MIC. And this is actually uh, capital O, number six, capital O, number nine, is the MIC for the IMCI, okay? And one of the key things is when you do get your supplemental numbers, you place them adjacent to the original, and you never place it over the original because we don't want to confuse them that this may be a stolen boat. So we place them to the original. They supplement the manufacturer's original hull numbers. Part of the process is preparation of all the documents. We mentioned a few of them uh, as far as declaration, application. Well, now we need supporting documents that supports all the standards that are applicable to that craft. And uh, first thing we have to, and, and with this document pre uh, preparation, we typically call it a tech file. It's called a technical file. And the IMCI or any notified body is required by law to keep all of this information on file for 10 years. Okay, so as we're preparing this document, first off, for a used boat, maybe we'll call the manufacturer. Is there any documents available for this craft? You know, is there any stability? Are there any um, uh, lamination specs or, or anything to that uh, effect? Uh, is there an owner's manual? Is there an owner's manual available? Uh, what about exhaust emissions? Does this uh, boat have any, uh, has it ever been sound tested? Okay, does it, uh, uh, excuse me, there's the sound. The exhaust emissions will be, is this Mercury engine uh, or, or whatever engine, has it passed uh, some reliable uh, certification program? We'll talk about that in a moment as well. Uh, we have a series of relevant checklists that we'll have to uh, supply with the, uh, with the uh, package. Those checklists are published, and they're also available here. At, the, at a website, and uh, all of the documents uh, there are freely uh, downloadable, and you can use them. 
some of the other supporting documentation that we need to provide, or do we have flame retardant materials in it about the stove or uh, in the engine space? We need to make sure that those particular materials are flame retardant. Uh, what kind of information do we have for stability? What kind of information do we have for structure? And structure is unique with regards to PCA, and we'll get into that in a moment as well. But one of the key, key, key aspects of uh, proceeding with a PCA is exhaust emissions. Okay, does this engine pass the current standards that they have placed on uh, emissions of particulate matter, uh, nitrous oxide emissions, hydrocarbons, and, and those things? So we have to, first thing you have to do is, uh, is make sure that this vessel has appropriate documentation to support the emissions uh, of, the, uh, of the emissions requirement. The next is sound emissions, okay? This particular vessel here that I've got probably won't pass sound emissions due to the headers coming out of the back, but uh, again, uh, it can be tested if it passes, and we'll get into that, uh, and it can be accepted. But in this particular case, first look at this boat. Hmm, does this thing have a, a sound certificate? And uh, doubtful it would ever pass. Staying on the uh, exhaust emissions, we have to confirm them, okay? And one of the requirements is that this plate be on the engine somewhere. Okay, typically Merck Cruiser's been putting them on the heat exchangers. Uh, Volvo has them. Typically might be on a valve cover, but you have to locate this particular plate. And what it has here is this engine on this particular one says it conforms to California emissions. Okay, and we'll get in. And uh, so now we know this one at least has an emissions requirement. We know that there is some sort of documentation. The plate is key. The plate is key. It must be on the engine, some, some label of some sort. For uh, gasoline engines, and the European Union calls it spark ignited engines, SI engines, Okay, we are allowed to use California Air Resources Board. Typically, that's going to be a three-star or better engine. So if you've seen those emissions star label ratings, look for that three-star or better rating if you're, uh, if you're a California Resources Board certified engine. The other uh, availabilities are uh, EPA. We'll also have some uh, engines out there with EPA. And then some of the more benign ones that we don't see too, too much around here is what they call BSO. That's a Lake Constance. That's a European uh, certification. But we certainly are, there are certainly some engines, some of the Volvo packages will have a BSO label on them as well. If you run across the, an engine that has a declaration of conformity here in the, uh, in the owner's manual, you have to look for the CE mark on the engine plate. You can see this one says not for sale in California. Actually, the California regulations for this engine are tougher than the EU. But here, if you see the CE, then you can look at the engine owner's manual, and here is a declaration inside the owner's manual, this engine is good. If, um, uh, if you are uncertain, contact your notified body, send them as much information as you can so that they can confirm uh, before you proceed uh, any further. The uh, diesel engine certification, the European Union calls it CI, compression ignition. Okay, again, must have a label on the engine. And here are all the, uh, are all the uh, uh, different certifications that may be applicable to that engine. So you just go down. The EPA has several EU. A lot of them are based on horsepower or kilowatt ratings. So again, that label on the engine is going to uh, tell you if it's any kind of certification. Here's a typical Yanmar engine, and here it has complies with the EPA regulations. Okay, so we uh, on this particular engine, there is data available, and I always recommend that you contact the notified body to make sure that it is applicable. Some of the EPA regulations have been phased out, and the EU has recently tightened rules back in June of 2009 that some of these even EPA or even Lake Constance certified engines will not pass anymore. Yeah, Dennis, we'll talk for a second about Lake Constance before you go on. It's something that people may not know sure. about, but it's an incredibly polluted lake in, in Europe. And some of these, uh, it's almost like, I, I would guess you'd say, Europe's California, where they have this little microchasm of trying to clean this lake up. So they created these very tough um, emission requirements. And yeah, uh, that's Europe, the Lake Constance data. Yeah. 
Yeah, very polluted lake, uh, similar to Lake Erie back in the 70s, uh, ready to burst into flames from what I understood. And, and uh, so, yeah, a lot of these uh, emissions and, and such regulations stem from the Lake Constance Convention. Okay, so sticking with exhaust emissions, we also have outboard and PWCs. Same thing. Label on the engine is a key, absolutely key. If the label has fallen off the engine, you can contact the manufacturer and they will uh, most likely ship you a new label uh, if it indeed has certification. The other um, uh, certifications are Lake Constance again, which is BSO. There is uh, for four strokes, there's stage two for two strokes. Here, four strokes there. EPA also has uh, a non-road spark ignition rule. And California Air Resources Board, again, uh, has a rule for these engines. And again, we're looking for three star, uh, three star or better. Again, three star. And on this next slide, you'll see that's that three star label we're looking for, OK? But just because it has that sticker, we need to make sure, we need to cross reference to make sure, A, if it has a CE mark, then there's a declaration uh, available. Uh, so just because it has this nice sticker on it doesn't mean, you know, somebody can get those stickers and attach them anywhere. So a notified body may not accept uh, the engine certification based on having this sticker alone. Okay. One note here, when you're certifying a used boat, only outboard boats can be certified without engines. Okay, so if you have a boat that's going, that's just been purchased or contemplating purchase, and it's got an older engine that doesn't pass the, uh, the emissions requirement, uh, we can still certify that boat uh, less the engine. The actual certificate will read, this uh, boat has passed, uh, has a post-construction assessment certificate with approved engines. Okay, so the certificate will note with approved engines. But this is not so for stern drives or inboard boats. They, uh, they cannot be certified without engines. They must be powered uh, to be able to be certified, completely certified. So that's the emissions portion of the requirement. The sound emissions is, uh, <clears throat> is another animal altogether. Uh, it's the 14509 standard. It was issued uh, in January of 06. Okay, so typically it's all non-integral exhaust, typical inboard exhaust. Uh, and the like. Uh, stern drives and outboards, however, may need to be tested. If you've got an outboard that's built prior to January of 06 and the manufacturer uh, is not ready to send you a letter that this meets the sound requirements, uh, these engines will have to be tested, even if it's original equipment, through hub exhaust, uh, you know, same original equipment from the manufacturer. If there's no data available, we will have to test. Okay. Keep that in mind. Through transom exhaust, such as uh, in uh, uh, this particular example, okay, uh, typically those will fail. Okay, but it all depends on what's behind it. Could be a water lift muffler, uh, but typically when you see a transom exhaust like that, it's for the noise, uh, turning gasoline into noise for uh, over uh, 20 years now. So uh, typically when you see those, uh, uh, we have to take another step because they will not allow them in the EU. Uh, even if they're switchable, like you're having a captain's choice or silent choice or many of the other products that are out there, they have to be disassembled. All portions of that bypass system must be removed and returned to original equipment, uh, be it Merck, Volvo, uh, wherever the, uh, the manufacturer is. So it has to, you can you know, box up the uh, bypass system, you can ship the box to the uh, new owner, that's fine. Uh, but uh, when this boat gets to port, it has to be the original equipment uh, exhaust system through hub, typically. So if you do need a sound assessment, it's very easy to do. It doesn't take long. The hardest part is finding a place to do the, the, the sound testing and setting up of the equipment. That seems to take the longest portion of the time. But it really is very quick. Two passes to port, two passes to starboard. Okay, at its max speed or 50 knots, whichever is less. Okay, we want to have calm conditions because we don't want to have hull slap. Uh, in a rough condition, you could have a hull slap that could up the de uh, decibel readings. So we want to have calm conditions, uh, very little wind, about 7 meters per second wind, about uh, no more than about 12, 13 mile an hour winds. 
Uh, we don't want to have any seawalls behind us or any other hard background surfaces. This has a tendency to echo around and raise the decibel reading. So we want to uh, have as uh, little background, hard, hard surface backgrounds behind us as, as possible. The test is done at 25 meters. So the boat runs by the measuring equipment at 25 meters, about 83 feet or so. And uh, again, two ports to starboard, uh, two runs to starboard, two runs to port. And the criteria is a 75 decibel reading for a single uh, engine and 70, uh, 78 for twins or more. If you have three engines, it's still 78. These are very low numbers. They're very difficult to achieve, and uh, and the boat is very quiet. So. Uh, any variation above will constitute a failure. Uh, with PCA, the sound declaration is, um, with the IMCI in Belgium is part of the PCA certificate. So you will have a sound certification as well as your PCA certificate as part of your certification. The um, <clears throat> test course is very straightforward. And here's a uh, diagram right from the ICE. Uh, the uh, sound meter is placed three and a half uh, meters above the water surface, plus or minus a half. And here's your 25 uh, meters from the vessel, from the microphone. Typically what we found is that the higher you are, the lower readings you'll get. So if you get a vessel that fails at three meters, which you're allowed to be at, uh, try it at four meters. And uh, we've had boats pass at four meters that failed at three. So something to keep in mind when we're testing. But again, the key is finding a place to do it. To Fort Lauderdale, Miami area, uh, there's a lot of no sp uh, slow speed, no wake zone, so we're out in either Biscayne Bay or we're offshore with a chase. So again, something to keep in mind. So that's exhaust sound. Now we move into stability. Okay, and I'm going to actually jump ahead. Uh, just a few slides here, because before I get into stability, I want to talk about the categories, because stability works right into categories and how we're going to uh, support the category that this craft's going to be in. As John mentioned, they're lettered A through D. They're actually lettered A, uh, and they and they put it in as offshore, or excuse me, as ocean. You can see here. Let me grab my little stamp. You'll see A is off uh, ocean, B is offshore, C is inshore. Uh, excuse me, and then D is sheltered waters, which is lakes and rivers and such. Um, uh, however, in, in theory, it's not supposed to limit the operational air, uh, area of the boat. We do have some countries uh, that will limit the operational area, however. Uh, we have countries such as Italy, France, um, and even maybe uh, Canary Islands. They will limit uh, the distance that a boat can be offshore. Now, in some of these countries, if you have a vessel that can't get into Category B uh, but only Category C, uh, you are able to get a variance to increase your distance based on the boat geometry, and that's a local official that will come down and look at the boat, and he'll grant you the exemption to go 12 nautical miles if you're a Category C. So we have done that in the past. But really the key was for development of these is to differentiate the level of risk associated with a particular boat design. So how does this boat handle in weather, seas, conditions, and what are the risks associated with that craft? That's really the reason for the development of the lettered system. And if we look, each uh, design category has a wind force requirement uh, and a significant wave height uh, description for the category. Okay, So the significant wave height is actually a third, an average of the third highest waves. Okay, and that is uh, this number here. The key is that that is the average height. Uh, we could have significant wave heights that uh, exceed it by twice. So significant, uh, so um, uh, maximum wave height can be um, uh, in an offshore boat can be eight meters. And I'll give you some uh, give you some graphics there in a moment. But um, but uh, we also have the Beaufort scale. That's that Beaufort scale really describes wind and waves. Uh, but for this particular uh, description, they are just really talking about the wind force. And a Category B boat has a wind force of a maximum of about uh, almost 50 miles an hour, 48 miles an hour or so. 
a significant wind, and we're talking about gale force at that point. So it certainly would be a small craft warning in that in that particular situation. But here are again the key. The key here is the wave height uh, with regards to the design category. We've got a couple graphics just to give you a visual of what these categories look like uh, with regards to the vessel size. Here we have an 8 meter boat, about 26 to 27 foot boat, showing a significant wave height here of 4 meters, okay, about 13, 13 and a half feet. And here's the maximum wave height, so it's nearly topping the mast here on this. Uh, 24 foot boat. So it's a good graphical visualization of what kind of waves are we looking at here. When we get into the uh, uh, other categories here, we're looking at about a 27 and a half foot, 28 foot boat here, power boat. Okay, significant wave is already over the coach roof, already over the top, and maximum wave height. And we're talking category B now. Maximum wave height is uh, uh, nearly three times the, the, the actual height of this particular vessel in, in this uh, example here. Some of our most popular categories are C and D, okay? But you can, as you can see here, a category C wave can indeed be 13 and a half feet. So, um, again, not great conditions for boating in any sense of the word. Okay, now I'm going to jump back and get into the stability. So that is... A dis, uh, description of the categories. So to support the category, we have to look at stability. The standard for stability is the 12217 standard. Okay, there is an amendment as of 09 uh, for this standard. It's mostly affecting smaller boats right now, um, trying to add a little bit more margin of safety. We used to use 75 kilograms as the uh, person's weight, but in testing now, we have to go up to as high as 98 kilograms for testing. Uh, it's not affecting the larger boats so much, but it is affecting some of the smaller boats, and so there's going to be some posting requirements uh, uh, with regard to that. With PCA, we are allowed to use something unique to prove stability, and that is using a logbook to document uh, the voyages. Okay, it has to be a very good record, but here is the key to using a logbook: is right here, not less than those applicable in the design category. So that means this vessel will have had to have encountered conditions uh, at least as great as the maximum allowed by the category. So if it was a category B, we want to have some sort of documentation showing that this vessel was in indeed these conditions on this date with this wind force. And, um, and so those are, hard doc those are hard log books to find. And we have an example here uh, of uh, a boat that we certified a few years back. Uh, it was originally certified as a Category B by the original manufacturer. However, there was, uh, and that was prior to 2002. Now, they continued to build this boat through 2008, and we're using the original certificate, so they didn't have to comply with any new amendments. So we had no documentation for stability, and uh, so the owner thought we could use the logbook. And I thought it was really neat that uh, I, I wanted to include it here in uh, this presentation. But there is a log entry here on 5901. Uh, had to stay four extra days due to wind and waves. Uh, today it is 5 to 7 foot, 7.30 a.m. Uh, looks like at 2.45 they got back. and. She writes, uh, the owner's wife writes, never again, sick. So here we are, and we're in conditions of Category C, uh, not, uh, uh, very close to not even maximum conditions of Category C, and this fellow wanted Category C for this boat. Uh, so in this case, absolutely not. We couldn't, uh, uh, we couldn't use this documentation to support stability. This boat ended up being in Category C. A uh, lot less requirements. We don't have to worry about generating stability curves, and I'll get that into that in a moment. It was interesting here, too. John noticed this this morning. They ran aground the next day. <laughs> Anyways. With Category A and B boats, we have to calculate the riding moments. We have to, have to, we must provide this data. Okay, and this is a tedious uh, process. Uh, requires possibly an incline test. Uh, so we can determine the vertical center of gravity and possibly the longitudinal center of gravity as well. Okay, and typically we'll use a software package for this calculation. It's very tedious to do by hand, 
and typically it's done in a CAD program. And uh, but uh, the resulting information that we're looking for is on the next slide here. Uh, excuse me, one more. Okay, am I missing? So the resulting information that we're looking for is is a graph similar to this, and it's a graph based on the heel angle, which is the x-axis. The x-axis is the heel angle, and then the y-axis is the riding moment. So this axis right here is the riding moment. So here's our riding moment, and here's our healing moment. Okay, so we need this graph. From this graph, we have a heel mo uh, moment due to wind. That's this line right here. Okay, this particular, uh, from this distance to this distance here, is the assumed roll angle. Okay, and then this line here is the lesser of the down flood angle, the point at which water will come in the boat, or the angle of vanishing stability, big word for this boat's flipping over, uh, or 50 degrees, whichever is less. Okay, so from that we calculate the area, and get my other little tool, we have to calculate this area here underneath the curve, from this, these lines here to the top curve, and we have to compare it to this area. So this is the area that keeps the boat upright, this is the area that wants to take that boat over. Okay, so obviously the result must be this area under curve must be larger than the A1 area. So that's a brief description of what we're looking for in writing moments. So again, those numbers are, are generated typically from a computer modeling program. For category C and D, you know, do we have uh, sufficient documentation for stability and flotation? Category C and D uh, can be a very simple um, stability test, and we can use people uh, for that. We can bring as many people on board. What we want to look for is crowding, and then we want to measure from the water line to what they call the down flooding point. That's the point at which water will enter the vessel. Okay, so that's what we're measuring when we're doing, these st uh, doing a stability test. Buoyancy can be another thing that's uh, a, a bit difficult to determine. Typically what I've done in the past is contacted the manufacturer and got some sort of statement from him saying that uh, our vessels uh, pass the uh, flotation requirements. So we're able to use that as documentation for, uh, for our buoyancy. But um, I've not yet had to float test and sink a boat uh, as far as to check stability of uh, buoyancy, uh, but certainly if there is no information if you're going to claim buoyancy and there's no information whatsoever and there's nobody supporting you, you have to assume that there is no buoyancy within the craft. Uh, with the categories, all categories, we have to define max persons, number of persons, and then the max weight capacity. Uh, that will include uh, anything you're going to bring uh, on board from consumables to uh, uh, life rafts, um, any, any number of items that could come on the boat is also included in the max weight capacity. Now we do have some strategies, like the boat I mentioned before, that you want a category B. Uh, we didn't have any documentation, so the strategies we use is downgrading the category. We recently did a couple of boats uh, that were originally built in 99-2000, designed in 99-2000, and uh, they were originally given a category designation of B. And what we had to do um, uh, on these particular vessels, they would not pass Category B as written today. Uh, they had down flood openings, which was the engine intakes were too low to the water. Uh, the stability was marginal. And, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, so we took the strategy of just downgrading the category. Um, that gets us our CE certification. So we went from B to C, no issues, uh, everybody's happy. And then the other strategy is for dual category. As we saw in the other example of the builder's plate, we had a six, uh, six and 12 persons. Uh, we can do the same thing with, uh, with B and C categories, where we can limit persons to uh, two. Say we have the writing moments, so uh, we'll work out for, for a minimum crew uh, or a minimum weight. We can downgrade the persons in weight capacity to, to make uh, the category B and then give them more persons for, uh, for a lesser category. Here's an example of that builder's plate again, same one that we showed you earlier. Again, we're doing a dual category, C and D on this particular one. And using the slash mark, we indicate C on this side and D on the opposite side of the slash mark. So that is absolutely acceptable. 
I'm going to jump ahead here. So now we'll get into what are some of the common things we have to look for during an inspection of a used boat. One of the first things we look at is uh, protection of falling overboard and means of reboarding. Actually, the ISO standard is 15083. Okay. Um, on occasion, or a part of the standard is that the rails about the working deck must have a minimum height okay, in millimeters, and it's typically right around 24 inches. We're dealing with uh, the English units. Okay, so if these rails do not meet, say they come in, say this rail now comes in and dips, dips low, okay, now we, we don't meet the rail requirement on, on the side of the vessel. What we can do is in the owner's manual, we can make a small sketch and indicate that only this area is the working deck. So you do not walk around this area when the boat is underway. And you access cleats, uh, anchoring gear, whatever, through the hatch, through the vessel's hatch. Okay, that's totally allowed. And uh, whether people will do that is not, uh, you know, certainly it's recommended, and certainly that's what this vessel will call for. But that is a, uh, one way that we get out if we have bow rails that don't make the minimum height requirement. There's also a requirement for foot stops, uh, tow rails, as we call them in ABYC. Uh, they are a minimum requirement of three-quarters of an inch for Cat C. They are one inch for Cat A or B boats. So that's the tow rails all the way around the perimeter here have to meet, depending on the category, have to meet those minimum requirements. And whatever you're using for lifelines or guidelines, bow rails, okay, they have to have sufficient strength. Uh, sufficient height, uh, the strength requirements are uh, identical to the ABYC uh, pull test for handrails, handholds, and, and the like. Part of the prevention of falling overboard is providing uh, grab rails for uh, persons in, seated in the exterior of the vessel, so exterior seating. Anything inside the boat does not need a handrail, okay, but exterior seating does because as the standard uh, states it's for prevention of falling overboard. Okay, so we need handholds for exterior seating. Uh, any standing position, center console boats uh, will probably have more persons than seating. So wherever those standing positions are, need handholds. Uh, if we've got stairways going up to um, uh, to uh, tuna towers and such, also uh, handholds and the like. And then uh, companionways coming out of the cabin into the exterior of the vessel also needs handholds of some type. And a number of things can be handhold devices as well. But, uh, uh, but certainly something needs to be there so you can get a good purchase as you're moving about the vessel. One thing is a little bit different with ISO as compared to ABYC is the means of reboarding. Uh, means of reboarding are typically a swim ladder. It can be uh, it can be uh, uh, other things could be foot pa uh, pads or, or the like. Okay, well one of the key differences is the ladder need not be in place to meet this requirement. So if there is no means of reboarding, you can uh, uh, just provide some sort of ladder with the vessel that's loose. It doesn't have to be in place, but you will have to describe those means in the owner's manual. This particular portion of the standards is talk right now about changing this standard that it must be very similar to ABYC, which is deployable from the water. But as of today, the standard is as long as it's in place is what they're looking at. Field of vision, almost identical to ABYC H1. Okay, at least one helm station must comply. So if you have a dual helm boat, and uh, a lower station and an upper station, one of those stations must comply with the visibility requirements. If there's too much structure around the lower helm, but you have perfect visibility above the lower helm, all you have to do is tag it, that uh, field of vision is, is uh, limited. Okay, so uh, here's your typical warning label. So if you do have a station that doesn't meet it, but the other station does, similar to ABYC, just label the station that does not comply with the uh, visibility requirement. Owner's manuals are key. Market surveillance of, uh, authorities uh, in all of the EU countries, one of the first things they reach for is the owner's manual. Uh, this particular manual I use, it's a, 
uh, as an amendment to an original manual. If, uh, if the original manual doesn't have all of the information that's required, I generally purchase one of these, uh, these particular manuals. Um, I, I purchase them from Ken Cook. I think they're well done. I don't promote them, uh, but I do use them, and, um, and they do have a lot of the essential requirements that allows you to amend some of the original owner's manuals. Uh, what I like about it, too, it's in a number of different languages, a uh, number of different languages from uh, uh, SV, Slovakian, I believe, all the way from English, and there's a French. Um, and the authorities love to see documentation in their language. While English is accepted in almost all the countries or recognized as an official language, um, a lot of the notified or a lot of the surveillance authorities still like to see something in their native language. So this is part of the presentation and, and certainly helps uh, uh, getting past the registration process. Uh, this manual has all of the essential items. One of the things we do do is add the principal data uh, that is not in the generic manuals, and that will be length, beam, draft height, displacement, max trailer weights if applicable, if it's a trailered vessel, the category, maximum load, person's capacity, proper operation, all of those things we'll have to add uh, into the, uh, uh, as amendments to even, even to the generic manual. PCA is a little bit different with structure as well. Uh, we're not required to do the calculation to 12215. We are allowed to do an inspection. So as an inspector, I will certainly hammer the hull, uh, maybe put a moisture meter on it. Um, typically, uh, I'll ask that if a fellow is considering buying a, purchasing a new boat, that he get a survey done prior to even uh, uh, you know, going forward with the purchase. So with that survey, uh, we can support the structure. A typical surveyor will, will do all of the things necessary to identify any kind of delamination any kind of moisture issues, and uh, so we use that to support our structure. And in addition to my inspection, I'll look at interior framing, a uh, number of things, but, um, but typically a, a good surveyor will be able to uh, support our structure uh, requirements. One of the things uh, that I always try and do, is there any manufacturer information available? Is there a laminate schedule? Are there drawings available? Okay, anything that we can get for information, to help support structure, uh, we do. Uh, we also look at are there any Coast Guard recalls. And then Europe has what they call a RAPEX list. Okay? And they'll list anything that they found that's a problem in, their, uh, in the EU. So it's kind of similar to the USCG recall list as well. So all of this item helps support our structure. So it keeps us from avoiding of drilling holes in the hull and documenting the number of layers of laminate and in the, in the sandwich structure, if applicable, and then doing the calculation based on plate sizing and plate location and speed of the craft and, and displacement of the craft. We don't have to get into that. So that is a real big difference between what a new manufacturer has to do and what we can, uh, what we can do in PCA, post-construction. As far as openings in the hull deck and superstructure, that's the EN ISO 12216. Okay, so we're looking at hatches, windows, port lights. Okay, we are able, we are allowed to do inspection on these items as well. So they don't necessarily have to be Annex 2 components, which are CE mark components. We can take, as I've done here, we do a measurement, a span measurement. And then we do, uh, on the right picture, we do a, a, a thickness measurement, and then we uh, can do it either by calculation or there's a chart in ISO 12216 that will tell you if this thickness of this glass is sufficient. Okay. One of the things we do look for is if we have deck hatches and such. Uh, typically, most of the boats being produced in the U.S. right now will have a CE mark deck hatch. Um, uh, but uh, if they don't, if it looks homemade, uh, there are a couple tests we'll have to do. Typically, it's going to be a rope jam test, uh, but, uh, uh, but we haven't had any problems with any of these in, uh, in my past inspections. But we do inspect. The other critical thing with regards to getting into category A and B is sufficient cockpit drainage. Uh, that's based on the volume of the cockpit, how much water will it retain, and from that we can calculate some reference times and from that reference time is uh, we can either calculate or we can use the chart 
to determine our size. Is our size opening for uh, cockpit drainage sufficient to meet the requirements of A and B? Okay, category C and D does not have a requirement for cockpit drainage. Okay, so there are, within the standards, there are some uh, leeways that they give you if you have flaps and uh, or if there's a pipe sizing or a pipe distance. Uh, there are a few different strategies that you can use to, um, to meet this requirement. But it must be calculated and it must be proved that the, the drainage size is sufficient for a craft. The same way that a new boat manufacturer will do. Uh, plumbing. Are these drains plumbed correctly? This was on a sailboat. Uh, that I looked at, and uh, I don't know if it was in a, they were in a hurry, uh, they needed to save this vessel, but they took tin can skins and uh, for, for drainage, for recess drainage. Needless to say, this boat has not been CE uh, marked yet. Another thing we have to look at is cockpit heights, the, uh, the actual sill heights, uh, and that's going to be for A and B boats. Minimum sill height is going to be three inches. Okay, and then we also want to look at the seals around the hatches. We want to have a sealed cockpit hatch. Bilge pumps, uh, a lot of misnomers about bilge pumps. Um, on open boats, they're recommended but not required. And these are the smaller category boats, category D typically. Okay, fully decked boats, they may need an additional pump. It all depends on where the main steering station is. Is it exposed? Okay. Does it need a manual pump? These are all, uh, there's a little uh, graph in the, um, in the standard uh, that uh, will let us know if we need an additional manual pump. Okay, if it does discharge below the max heel water line, check valves are not appropriate for this. We have to have a seacock for these, uh, for bilge pumps. Rule of thumb that I use is for every max, one foot of max beam, three quarters of an inch above the water line. Um, when the boat's in static position, repose. So if that through hole is be between the water line and that max heel, you need a sea cock. Some of the typical things we've been finding. We do have to notate life raft storage within the owner's manual. Okay, we don't need to, uh, life raft need not be present for the certification. Okay, but we do have to have uh, some notation on where the life raft's located. Another important standard is the 9094, that's fire uh, suppression. Uh, it's typical for enclosed accommodation boats, including multi-hulls. Okay, so hatches, we need to have alternate means of escape. If it's blocked by um, um, a galley with an open flame cooker, so we need an alternate means of escape or a certain distance, so we're looking at hatches. Okay, so they must open from the interior. If anybody's ever seen the little dots, the little round dots, those are actually, you can step on them with your foot and turn them, so this thing, the hatch will actually open from the outside as long as it's unlocked. Okay, we might need a ladder if the hatch distance from the bunk top exceeds 1.2 meters. So you can see in this picture on the left, they've actually installed a ladder, and it must be installed. It has to be a permanent ladder. So in this case, it's a, roll, it's a rope ladder, and it just rolls up, and it tucks in right underneath the uh, right underneath the screen when the screen closes. So there's a couple of things we look at there. Uh, anchoring, mooring, and towing. Uh, again, we inspect the cleats. We don't have to do any calculations. We don't have to prove strength. We're inspecting. And uh, if they're not there, uh, certainly we have to install something for anchoring or mooring. Handling characteristics are limited to boats under eight meters. Okay. And typically, they're the high-speed boats. Now, there is a test, maneuvering test. If it doesn't meet the test, same as the ABYC, we have to label that maneuverability above a certain speed, whatever that certain speed is limited. Appears this one had a problem with maneuvering at some time. Gasoline engine spaces are key. Um, same standards as ABYC. We're looking for appropriate ventilation uh, the standard is in metric, uh, but it translates uh, uh, almost identically to the ABC requirement, ABYC requirement of H2. Also, we're looking for, uh, we're looking for, uh, excuse me, looking for ignition protection to be on anything, any electrical motor that's in that engine space 
or any electrical device that may cause a spark has to be marked ignition protected. Hey, Dennis, just to add to that, the uh, Coast Guard just uh, agreed with a uh, literature search not that long ago that the CE ignition protected standard also yes. meets the uh, the U.S. ignition protected standard. So you could put a CE marked ignition protected uh, uh, piece of equipment, you know, where you would normally get one from uh, the 33 CFR or UL 1500. Right, great. Now you can see on this uh, pump here, it's got a CE mark on it. It's not required for PCA to have a CE mark. This is what they consider an only two component. Uh, but the key is definitely having the ignition protection marking on it. So we do know that that will not be a source of ignition have, uh, if we have a fuel leak or if there's excessive uh, fuel vapors in, uh, in that space. Uh, we're looking at ventilation. This particular one shows the hoses coming off. So we want to make sure that the ventilation system is in good working order. Uh, next slide we show uh, both that we did. Uh, he had a refrigerator inside a gasoline engine space. Okay, there was no markings for ignition protection. Um, I absolutely had to take this out. I absolutely had to take this out. Fuel systems, we don't have to worry about CE marking of the fuel tanks or the fuel lines. Okay, but as uh, during the inspection, we will look to make sure that they're in good condition. We do have to look at, um, uh, we do have to inspect for leaks, and we do not require a pressure check. You know, you don't, I have a real problem with pressure checking fuel systems that have had fuel in them prior. Okay, pressurized fuel of any type is, is pretty dangerous, so a fuel pressure check is not required. We do need fuel shutoffs, though, uh, certainly, uh, or anti-siphon protection. And these, anti, uh, these fuel shutoffs on, uh, on an application must be uh, reachable from outside of the engine space. Okay, so we have to make sure they can be reached from outside of the engine space. If you do have fuel filters that are inside an engine space, we have to make sure that they are fire rated. Okay, and typically that's these bowls. These, these metal bowls underneath these fuel filters, these are typical Raycor types. Uh, but those metal fuel bowls are there so that these filters will pass the fire rating. Just a little note there. Here's a photograph from a boat that was repowered. We looked at it recently. Um, this boat will not get CE marked anytime soon. Uh, it was repowered. They did label it. Now it's a diesel. However, I don't know if you see that, but it's a gas cap. Um, so uh, uh, the cap needs, certainly needs to be changed. Electrical systems, one of the misnomers out there is do I need to convert it to a uh, 230 volt, 220 volt, whatever you want to call it, 50 hertz. There is no requirement to do that. Obviously, you cannot use the shore power in the EU unless you convert the system somehow. Now, there's a couple ways to do that. You can either convert the whole system to all EU power, or you can install an isolation or polarization transformer. If you, uh, if you do install an isolation or a polarization transformer, you want to check your appliances. Typically, these will be AC systems, uh, anything with an AC motor, check to make sure that it's compliant with 50 hertz. Here in the U.S., we are 60 hertz, okay? So we have to make sure that at least those appliances on board will actually work. If you do install an isolation or polarization, you're still required to install what the EU calls an RCD, a residual current device. That's kind of like a GFCI that we have uh, in our bathrooms and in our kitchens here in, in the home or in our boats, same thing. In uh, wet areas, we install GSCIs. Uh, ABYC, of course, now has a requirement for ELCIs. ELCI, almost identical to an RCD, just certified to a different voltage rating. Okay, it measures the imbalance within the hot and the neutral. So here we're preventing shock in the water shock hazards. Uh, one of the other things we look at, make sure the conductors, they're supported, routed, they're terminated appropriately. There's uh, appropriate uh, overcurrent protection uh, for fuses, breakers, and the like. So we do look at uh, motor loads. We look at uh, line loads, and we make sure that the, uh, uh, the overcurrent protection is sufficient for, for the circuit. One other requirement for EU is a battery switch. You must have a battery switch. And it is installed. I've heard that. Some people mention that it needs to be installed in a negative conductor. That's not true. 
the battery switch is installed within the positive conductor, same as we do here in the U.S., but it needs one, needs a battery switch. Okay. Same as AC, we look at uh, chafe protection for uh, conductors. The thing is, if it's in an engine space, we want to make sure it's self-extinguishing. That's the only requirement that they have. If it's in an engine space, we want to use that new split chafe. If, uh, if we've got that shiny plastic bag stuff in uh, the engine space covering conductors, must be changed out to the new self-extinguishing type. And, of course, we look at conductor sizing, overcurrent protection, uh, and the like. Again, all of these are inspection. We're looking at electrical systems. Most of it is inspection. Is it in good working order? We do have uh, some CNG, so if the vessel has CNG, we uh, inspect it as well, but we want to make sure the locker is sufficient. This particular one had no cover uh, at all, had no gasketed cover, had no grommets, didn't even have a valve, leak detection. So all of those things must be taken into consideration when looking at LPG or CNG. This was a grill on a rail that had a clamp holding the hose on there, so that's not allowed, uh, no clamping allowed. So, again, following the guidelines, following the ISO standards, uh, we that's how we are inspecting these systems. Back to 9094 as far as protection, fire protection. Okay, you have to have either a fixed system or a fire port. So we need a fixed system or a fire port. Okay, fire port, which one? When are you going to have one over the other? Well, it's going to depend on the size of that engine space. Okay, how big is that engine space? Okay, so if it's small enough, we can size it for a fire port. These are very cheap. They are available uh, in your uh, marine hardware stores for about 15 bucks. Okay, but one of the things we have to do is make sure it's appropriately sized. So when we have a fire port, we have to provide a portable extinguisher. Okay, or we have to at least size it appropriately, and he can purchase his extinguisher overseas if he likes. But we have to size it appropriately. The bottle has to be sized. and has to be stored near that fire port. So if you are going to use a fire port, um, it's got to be noted in the owner's manual, appropriately sized, located. And then you've got to make sure that you can discharge the entire content of that bottle. Sometimes we've seen these these fire ports installed in between stairs, and, uh, such as a companionway stairs on a sailboat, and uh, very hard to get that bottle in there, so they have to uh, make sure that they've, they've located it in a good spot where you can discharge that portable extinguisher. Other part of this standard is, uh, oh, let me back up here a little bit. Fixed extinguishing systems, they might need to be changed. Okay, so if you're using a halon-based system, uh, will have to be changed. So you want to look for uh, a marking on there that's either FM200 or an FF2, uh, FE227. Those are the approved extinguishing mediums for, uh, for Europe. And you will also look in uh, this particular one. I'm not, I think it's a fire boy. I'm not sure what it is. You will have a CE mark on there, and it will indicate FM or FE227. When we get to portable extinguishing systems, Based on the type of the boat, we have to calculate the correct number. We have to note the location. Okay. We do not have to provide the portable extinguisher because some of the mediums used in these portable extinguishers are not appropriate uh, for some countries, and it's, uh, it's nation by nation. So, uh, uh, but what we do have to do is uh, locate and uh, uh, enter the correct number. We'll have to notate. That notation has to be done in the engine owner's manual or the uh, boat owner's manual. Uh, nav lights, again, proper, proper display, obstruction, you know, make sure they're not obstructed. Here's a uh, oh, wrong crayon here. Here's, uh, here's a light that's obstructed by a little satellite dome here. So we look at those things as well. Uh, discharge prevention, that's for the head discharge system. Must have a lockable. This is actually could work, uh, but you want to make sure that uh, here they're using tie wraps to make sure that this seacock stays shut. So I would pull on this seacock, and indeed, do, do these tie wraps keep me from opening or closing that seacock? And if it does, then it works fine. And here, if there's no mark on the waste discharge, we'll generally put a decal next to the waste discharge um, uh, fitting on the deck. That's a typical uh, pictogram for that. When we get to inflatable boats and ribs, 
very similar to uh, to the boats we've just been talking about. There are a few differences and um, a little bit more than we need to discuss today, but procedure is very similar, inspection, inspection, inspection. Personal watercraft, same thing, uh, very similar. However, we are looking at some ISO, uh, some different standards with regards to that. We're looking at a lot of the J, um, the J standards that we have to look at and make sure, and that's a different set of checklists, which is unpublished. So you ask, okay, we've done all the corrections, do I need a second inspection? Typically, no. Typically, if you email some clear digital photographs of the repairs or the changes, should be sufficient. Or if we need any additional documentation, you provided that. Say we wanted some documentation on materials that are uh, around the stove or whatever the case may be, if you provide those documents or if we get those documents uh, or help you get those documents, then that's sufficient for us. However, if we do get to really uh, boats that have a number of items um, or a, a complete refit, and you know, it's probably a good chance we're going to have to come back and 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 and, and reinspect. A lot of people ask, when does the CE certificate get issued? Typically, it's about three weeks after we submit all the documents to the notified body. Typically, depending on how busy they are at the home office or how complicated the file is. But on average, it's, uh, it's completed in about three weeks. Typically, it's there before the boat arrives in port. Okay, but we never issue any, all of the uh, supporting documents, the application file, everything that supports the CE application. We never submit it until all the variances are complete and documented. The reason we do this is because now we get into a start-stop position with the notified body. So what we want to do is we want to prevent, uh, present everything at one time and if they find some additional information or if they need additional information, we'll supplement. But uh, at least we don't have to start and stop, and they don't have to call and say, hey, did this get fixed, this get fixed. We've, we've documented. They can go through the package. And, and again, it takes about three weeks. And the CE certificate is sent to the uh, owner uh, via overnight courier uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as he pays his bill. So what happens if the boat arrives in port and there's no certificate? Well, it's no problem. A lot of boats that go to the EU that are not certified, they get certified in Europe. You can certify your boat there. Okay, but it's considered a gray market. It's a gray market. The owner can remove it from customs. All he has to do is tell the customs officer it's here. We don't have the certificate. We're working the certificate. Or if we started the process here and now he's waiting for a hatch or uh, who knows what, um, the, the customs will let him remove it. As long as he's not shipping a box or a number of boats, if he turns out to be a dealer and he's getting three, four boats, he may have to make special arrangements with his customs officer because they may not release the boat. Okay, but typically if it's a one boat, one owner situation, not an issue whatsoever. Okay. Uh, boats can be certified. Uh, da -da -da. Uh, some may prefer to register the boat when they get out to port. There's ports like Bremerhaven in Germany. Uh, they will provide full service that when your boat gets there, uh, you can register it. You can pay. Uh, you can pay your VAT. That's uh, that's unique to Europe. VAT is uh, the uh, value added tax, and VAT will vary from country to country. It can be as little as 18 percent and as much as 30 percent. Uh, so I'm told. So some. Uh, owners prefer to register in port in a country that has a lower VAT, value-added tax. It saves them on a $100,000 boat. If there's a 6% difference, uh, that uh, saves him a, a significant amount of money. But there is, uh, there is that. So how much does it cost? Well, it depends on four things. How much info is available on the boat? What is the desired category? What's the year of the boat? That's key. Uh, that can be key as well. And how large is the boat? Typically, give us a call. We'll give you an estimate. No problem. Another things that we get asked a lot: Can a surveyor assist? Absolutely. You can absolutely assist. You can create and you can do all the paperwork. You can do the application, all of the checklist, the owner's manual. You can do everything that I do. Whereas, if you went ahead and did all of this work and prepared all of the documents, and you got the owner's signature on all the documents where it's needed, and 
I come in and do the inspection and you have all these documents prepared for me or you send them to me at a later date, no problem. I, uh, it saves me a lot of time. These documents can be really tedious to fill out. And uh, some of you may have already tried, um, and so you know what I speak of. But, uh, but yeah, if you're so inclined, absolutely, no problem. Um, uh, I encourage it, actually. Uh, it makes my life easier. The more people know about the procedure and the processes, the easier it is for me. There's a lot less phone calls, a lot less emails, um, and, um, and the process at times goes a, a bit better, a bit quicker. And uh, let me slide here. John, I want you to jump in here. Because sure, Dennis, there are, no problem. Okay. Yeah, because there are some cer uh, seminars available. If you want to know more about CE certification, whether you're a new manufacturer or you want to know more about used boats and know more about the standards, there is a seminar every year. Uh, it's typically held in Tampa, Florida in March. Uh, it was just held last month, uh, but uh, it'll be coming around again. And I encourage you, if you want to know more, come to the seminar. There's a lot of people that, uh, that come in. Uh, it's a good way to talk with other people that are uh, dealing with the same issues or, uh, or trying to resolve the same issues, and it's a good way to meet uh, new people that, that know the standards, and, uh, and I encourage it. Yeah, and that, that is a good conference. You also uh, end up being there with some boat builders that are sending brand new boats over for CE certification. And I know Dennis uh, did a, an overview of all these things, but the nuances that are in those ISO standards can sometimes become uh, quite maddening. So getting a network that you know uh, to uh, help you interpret some of that stuff is incredibly helpful. And while we're on some uh, shameless commerce here, you can actually get access to the ISO standards on your existing Webster platform by upgrading it to what we call Webster Pro, which uh, gives you access to uh, all of the standards that are written into the RCD or the Recreational Craft Directive. So uh, it's, uh, it's well worth doing if this is something you think you may uh, get involved in. And as Dennis said, you know, uh, charging a customer as a surveyor or as a yard to do the, uh, the precursor work to the actual inspection uh, could be a fairly lucrative thing for you to uh, get involved in. Also, the repairs and, and the upgrades that are needed uh, for the CE mark, uh, you know, relying on Dennis to tell you what to do and then getting it done and doing the wrap-up and getting the information to him so he can get you the paperwork. That works out well. But uh, we are uh, right on time. We're actually three minutes ahead of schedule, which gives us a little bit of time for uh, some questions. I don't see any here waiting for me at the moment. Um, so uh, if you want to get them in, get them in very quickly. But uh, other than that, uh, Mike is, uh, is not able to wrap the call up, so he's asked me to go ahead and do that. Uh, I have a thanks from Canada. I'm assuming that's the entire nation of Canada. So thank you, Canada. The U.S. <laughs> loves you as well. Um, and uh, Dennis, do you have any wrap-up thoughts? Yeah, I do have a couple of wrap-up thoughts. Uh, obviously, we've just given uh, you know a few examples. Uh, there are many more. An uh, uh, hour and a half is not enough time to cover all of the standards. And so if you, if you all want to see a, a follow-up to this with uh, specifics, get in touch with John, and we'd be happy to put together something else for you guys. Yeah, that is the other thing. Uh, kind of like uh, Mike Rowe on Dirty Jobs, you know, we just need more and more ideas on webinars. If there's something you'd like to know about, email Mike New, mnew at abycinc.org, or email me or anyone you know that's, uh, that's uh, affiliated with ABYC and they can get these topics back. Can't guarantee that they'll be free like this one. I hope this was a good value for you. Uh, but I uh, can guarantee that we'll get some experts and get some calls on. So with that, I appreciate all of your attendance. Thank you for your ABYC membership. Uh, thank you for uh, bearing with us and uh, sticking through this presentation. And Dennis, thanks a lot for your help and your expertise. Much appreciated. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure to help. All right. Take care, guys. Have a good day. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That does conclude the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines.